And with that, um, go ahead and introduce our, our speaker, Teresa Thone. Um, she is the Regional Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator and currently focuses on aquatic invasive species related activities throughout the Pacific region, including Washington, Oregon, Idaho, parts of Montana, Hawaii, and the Pacific Islands through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Fish and Aquatic Conservation Program. After earning both a master's in conservation ecology and sustainable development and a PhD in ecology from the University of Georgia, she has worked on water resource issues in both North and South America for more than 20 years. Throughout her career, she has focused on a variety of issues, including aquatic invasive species, native fisheries, and water quality monitoring in diverse habitats, such as floodplain forests and desert springs. Um, the title of her talk today will be New Zealand Mud Snail Monitoring and Prevention in the Pacific Northwest. So welcome, Teresa. Thank you for being with us today. I know we're all eager to hear what you have to say. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. All right, can you hear me all right? We okay. can. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And welcome everybody. Let's make sure that my slides will go forward. All right. So as Jeremy said, I am Teresa Thome and I am with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And I'm coming to you live from Portland, Oregon and um, I do have a little disclaimer that this webinar is for educational purposes only and the opinions, ideas, or data presented in this webinar do not represent Fish and Wildlife Service policy or constitute endorsement by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I've tried throughout the talk to highlight images and any copyright or restricted use, but again, this is for educational purposes and any product names, companies, anything that's referenced doesn't imply federal endorsement. So there's a little disclaimer for you all. And just so we can all be swimming in the same direction for the next hour, wanted to highlight our journey together today. I have some background information on New Zealand mud snail. I'm sure that many of you are aware of, of this information, but I just wanted to highlight some background information. I wanna talk a little bit about different pathways of spread and then spend a fair amount of time on prevention including monitoring. Um, I've got some online resources that I've tried to compile and I do have my contact information. So if you have follow-up questions or need additional information or questions, feel free to contact me. All right, so jumping right in, New Zealand mud snail, they're small aquatic snails. And in the United States, the majority of adults are around six millimeters. They're right-handed snails, the opening is um, turn to the right, they're elongated with five to six whorls on their shell and a solid operculum. And so that closing, the operculum helps them close up and they can um, handle being out of the water for some time. Um, New Zealand mud snails are parthenogenic. And so basically this means that an egg can develop into an embryo without being fertilized at all by sperm. And um, so, Basically, in, in New Zealand, where it's native, uh, they have separate sexes. They're dioecious. They have males and female individuals, and they can bear live young. Um, but yeah, so in New Zealand, they have both either sexual or asexual reproduction. And the asexual reproduction, what we just talked about, the parthenogenic reproduction, is that the females basically produce cloned, genetically identical offspring. Um, which is pretty unique. And then they're ov ovoviparous, so they're being able to, the, this picture is a great example, the females actually, um, if you can see right here, there's the little um, eggs are developing in the female's brood pouch. And they, while the, the egg, the embryo develops inside the egg, they actually emerge um, as fully functional snails once they hatch out of the eggs live out of the adult snail. They're urohaline, which basically means that these snails can handle a variety of salinities um, from uh, freshwater salinities into more estuarine, almost uh, saline waters. And they're not just surviving, they're actually reproducing, eating, 
So they're, they're very tolerant of different salinities and also temperatures as well. So these snails can be found in thermally um, hot, like hot springs, as well as cold water. So um, they're, they're tolerant individuals, uh, snails. Some of the biology and ecology, they are grazers, typically more active at night, feeding on both um, epiphytic and paraphytic algae, diatoms, as well as detritus, the decaying matter in the streams or, or water bodies, as well as some sediments. They tolerate high siltation. And since they are grazers, they are able to be in high nutrient and eurotrophic uh, systems with because it helps with the algae growth. They also tolerate a wide variety of flows, so they can be found in um, high flowing uh, lotic waters or lentic systems where they're really not a lot of flow at all. Um, also vegetation, whether it's vegetation or not, uh, they can tolerate that a whole wide range of, of habitats and flows as well as substrates. So on, on aquatic vegetation, on rocks and soft substrates. So they, they really are a generalist snail. And they're very effective at producing very dense populations. And just, just to summarize a few of the studies from Australia as well as within the US, um, very dense numbers of snails, you know, up to 800,000 snails per meter squared. So just kind of thinking about that, if you put like three pieces of paper together end on end, that's about a meter. So if you did that, you know, think about what that looks like, um, you know, meter squared, 800,000, like a million snails in that small area. And so just with a numbers game, those dense populations um, can have large uh, impacts. And the, the densities do vary seasonally. So depending on the time of year that you're out surveying, you're, you may or may not see these high densities. There's just um, a visual. This is, um, I'm sure maybe some of you have been seeing these photos. Uh, but just again to show kind of the density that can be seen in a in a stream or on a rocks some of the substrates and streams and getting into some of the the known impacts from new zealand mud snail invasion uh, they do consume primary production and then they dominate the secondary production where they occur and really do change the ecosystem dynamics just in the in the act of feeding and then um, excreting waste. They can compete and displace native species, especially native invertebrates. Um, some of our uh, invertebrates, little snails and other, um, other grazers can be outcompeted. And New Zealand mud snails themselves are not really a great food source for things like um, fishes or other predators that might eat them um, because they are they have their operculum and they have a relatively um, uh, hard shell. They're really undigestible and it's been shown that they can pass through the digestive tracts of both fish and birds un unharmed at all. So um, they're not being digested as food. New Zealand mud snails are a biofouling organism just with the pure numbers. They can clog water, water pipes and other infrastructure and um, it's being looked into about uh, whether or not New Zealand mud snails can be a vector of things like blood fluke, which would be a human health issue. Currently, the known distribution of New Zealand mud snails is that they are native and endemic to New Zealand and adjacent islands, but have been introduced into Europe, Iraq, Turkey, Japan, the Americas, and Australia. And this is, um, there's, there's several really fantastic reports. I have uh, links to some of those, those resources later. But then within the US, the distribution in the West is really within the Snake River Basin and then in some of the coastal streams. And I have a graphic, hopefully this is gonna work. Let's see if this is 
going to play for you, but just showcasing. So New Zealand mud snails were first found in 19 in the late eight, 1980s in Idaho in the Snake River and have since then have progressed and moved um, moved into several different drainages in the West um, from a variety of pathways, including just downstream transport. And so you can just see over time, uh, now not just in the West, but starting to see populations in the Midwest as well. And this, this graphic, this progression is from the USGS, their Nuisance Aquatic Species Database, which is a really fantastic tool. Um, I will highlight in a little bit. And that's the most recent map. Just pulled that off the web the other day. And I do want to just, you know, make a statement that, um, you know, while we do have New Zealand mud snails in Western waters, Similar to zebra mussels in the Midwest, the New Zealand mud snails aren't everywhere. And, um, you know, like, like zebra mussels being introduced into some of the, the Great Lakes region in the 80s, there are still many streams and lakes that are uninfested with invasive dracinid mussels. So, um, again, this just highlights the importance of the work that we do um, to prevent further spread of an invasive species. and there is potential for further spread. This is a map showing the climate match for um, potential distribution of New Zealand mud snails in the US. And so this is from uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the, uh, we do ecological risk screening summaries. And a lot of this work has been done through the Great Lakes, um, some incredible work happening in the Midwest region with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so not just New Zealand mud snails, but other um, invasive aquatic species, they're, the risk of, of introduction and spread is assessed for those species. And this is all available online. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to highlight that uh, the in, in this map, the blue is low probability, very low climate matching um, low probability of introduction, but the reds, the, the orange and the red is, is higher climate match. So um, like great habitat for New Zealand mud snails. So the work that we do for prevention is really important to just limit the, limit the damage and limit the spread. And so how do New Zealand mud snails spread around? Well, just downstream dispersal. Um, New, New Zealand mud snails can attach to vegetation that can be moved downstream. They can be scoured out of an area and because they have a, a pretty robust shell, they, they can be scoured out and redistributed downstream and go on, go about their day-to-day -day life. Um, they even can float downstream on their own and also move rather relatively quickly for a snail. Um, so they can, they can move. Also, with the help of humans, we're good at moving things around with our watercraft and trailers and just water, water recreation. For water, water uses, we're looking at angling, um, you know, all, all types of things that go through, even bikes uh, riding through streams, ATVs going through streams, anywhere where you may have New Zealand mud snails, they're so small and they can get um, included in, in gear and nets and tires and waders and boots. So um, they really can move around quickly with people. And then just our natural resource management activities, that's a pathway, how we do our monitoring and making sure that our gear and equipment is clean, drain and dry when we're moving around from site to site is also important. Um, as well as commercial shipping. Ballast water has been implicated in a lot of introductions, and that is also part of the reason we have some New Zealand mud snails in the US. Um, sand and gravel mining, extraction, dredging, the aquatic plant trade and collections, aquaculture operations, um, fire suppression op 
operations, all these types of activities that involve water, raw water, could spread New Zealand mud snails. Um, and I highlighted to the transport by fish and wildlife. And again, um, New Zealand mud snails can pass unharmed through the digestive tract of fish and birds and, and other things. So um, that's another mode of transport. Um, but it shouldn't feel overwhelming. There's definitely ways to prevent and reduce and slow the spread. And we will get into to these, but I wanted to highlight, we do have laws and policies um, in place. And I have some examples. Risk evaluation is an important tool in prevention, as well as having best practices and standard procedures um, for our work to prevent the unintentional spread of aquatic invasives. Ongoing monitoring is a really important part of, of our work, especially being able to early detect early some of these invasions so that we could do, um, do something about that, as well as our outreach, not just only to the public, but in reach to ourselves as well. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about these. So some of our laws and policies, we're actually really lucky that a lot of our states have recognized the impact of New Zealand mud snails and they are listed as prohibited or restricted species. And so it's illegal to possess, transport or import these species without um, permits to do so. And Yes, yeah, so the states are definitely on board at, re at recognizing the impact of this, as well as many of our tribal partners. And, um, you know, we also do have a federal law, the Lacey Act, which I'm um, actually, I, I looked, it, I did not see New Zealand mud snail on the Lacey Act, but things like the zebra mussel is listed. And so that's um, injurious wildlife. Uh, we have a new law, you may be aware of the Vessel Incidental Discharge Act. And so VEDA, this is a, a recent law, it was um, finalized at the end of 2019. And it establishes a framework for regulating just incidental discharges from large vessels out of their normal operation. And it's tied to the Clean Water Act. Um, but it also includes addressing um, the unintentional spread of um, aquatic invasive species. And so EPA uh, is developing or has been developing national standards for what can be discharged. So this is an important law at preventing new introductions of not just New Zealand mud snails, but other things coming to North America from ballast water. And um, let's see, what happened to my policy? Uh, so then risk evaluation, this is uh, one kind of tool in the toolbox. I'm missing a slide. Um, anyway, I was just gonna highlight, uh, we have our, besides our laws and policies, we do have a policy. Uh, we have a regional, um, a regional uh, invasive species prevention policy for the Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, this is a unique thing. We, we have agreed this is signed by our regional director and that um, policy is, is basically our, our guidelines and what we are doing as an agency, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, to prevent um, the spread of invasive species as part of our day-to-day -day operations. And so that policy includes um, best management practices and procedures that we are, uh, that we agree to adhere to. So yeah, sorry, there's the laws and policies. I'm not sure what happened to that slide, but that's okay. Um, so then tying in to some of our best management practices is risk evaluation. And so looking at um, the activities that we do, and this isn't just for the Fish and Wildlife Service, this risk evaluation can be done for, for anything really. And it's just weighing to, ways to look at um, risk and in terms of invasive species. What's the probability that something could become established like New Zealand mud snails? And looking at climate matching, habitat suitability, and then also just the possibility that it could become established given 
um, known populations or different pathways, how many pathways are present. So, you know, looking at the different pathways, the entry potential, the colonization potential based on the habitat, and then how quickly it could spread. Um, and also then the consequences of establishment. So this is, you know, ways to look at um, activities that are done in, in, in the light of, of risk. And one tool that we have um, that the US Fish and Wildlife Service has really championed is called HACCP, and it's the Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. So this is just one type of a risk evaluation tool that can be done um, as part of planning. So before you even, so say before you even go out in the field, you can plan your activities. It's tied to, it has its origins in the space program, um, making sure that risk is reduced, uh, working in, um, you know, out of, out of earth. So uh, really, yeah, tied to the space program and it's also widely used in public health. And we've adopted, uh, we in general, like the, the federal government, especially Fish and Wildlife Service has adopted HACCP as a way to um, address invasive species pathways. And the ASTM, so that's the American Society for Testing and Materials. And uh, really it's just a way to um, provide technical standards and really with a key on enhancing performance and safety. So there are standard protocols related to hazard analysis and critical control point, including training. And I'm gonna spend a little time on this because this is, this is a real important tool for us um, as field biologists within the Fish and Wildlife Service of, of, of preventing accidental introduction of invasive species as part of our day-to-day -day work. And so we're, we're looking at each activity that we do, for example, um, you know, say we're going to be doing our water quality monitoring. And so that's, we would identify that as an activity. We would list potential hazards. So the hazards would be um, known infestations uh, of, of invasive species and, and write those down. And then we would break our activity into the sequence of actions, you know, where we're gonna um, park our vehicle, where we, um, deploy our water monitoring units, what we've done to that ahead of time. And that's, this is just one example, but then um, analyze the hazards and identify when or how to reduce risk. And again, the risk that we're focused on is accidentally um, moving around a non-target organism, a, an invasive species. And then there's an important feedback loop in that of analyzing, well, how did we do? Um, uh, what could we do better, what's working, what isn't. And I really view this kind of risk evaluation as just as important as some of our safety protocols. So anyway, this is just one example. And, and the Fish and Wildlife Service especially, we have really focused on, on HACCP for um, almost 15 years now, uh, probably longer than that, uh, related to some of our fish passage work requires this risk evaluation, um, any kind of restoration that we're doing. Um, also our fish hatcheries are utilizing HACCP um, as they bring fish on station or release, um, especially in the West, we're, we're focused on salmon and all of our, 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 some of our endangered fish, making sure that when we're moving salmon around, we're not also moving other things. Some other best practices so avoiding unnecessary exposure. And so this is, you're taking measures to minimize contact with invasive species at field sites and reduce the potential for unwanted introductions. And so an example of this would um, to be, to know, to be aware of the status of location of known invasive species along riparian areas. Say you have Phragmites or flowering rush um, and so you can uh, choose to avoid heavily infested sites or go to boat ramps that you know um, are not um, contaminated. Also, if you're working in partially invaded areas, planning out your sampling and what sampling sites you go to first so that you avoid introducing, um, if, if you're going to multiple sites in a day, 
you want to make sure that you're avoiding introducing um, invasive species to new areas. And also just how you go to a site, which way if you're moving upstream or downstream, um, so that you're not, you're uh, again, avoiding introducing invasive species to upstream areas. Um, maybe you can minimize waiting altogether if you know that there are known um, aquatic invasive species. And so being able to use bank sampling or, so there's, there's uh, ways to just avoid unnecessary exposure and so that's just one of our best management practices. And again, also inspecting and decontaminating our gear before going into the field, before moving between field sites, before or after returning from the field stations and, and um, knowing how to do this safely and effectively. Um, and again, the, the clean drain and dry, um, cleaning, clothing, vehicles, watercraft, and equipment, um, not just aquatic gear, but our terrestrial field gear as well. Um, you know, using stiff bristled brushes. Here with waders, if, you know, just even making sure that you're using um, lugged rubber boots instead of um, felt waders, which are really hard to um, properly decontaminate. So, um, anyway, being able to um, pressure spray um, with a, a hot, hot water, high pressure decontamination unit, brushing, freezing, um, even chemical decontaminants. So this is where um, we really rely on scientific literature to help with, you know, timing and concentration of of um, even just if it's 120 degree Fahrenheit uh, water, that's um, you have to have that come in contact with your boat for two minutes. You know, so just understanding what the um, you know the the requirements are to actually decontaminate, depending on the species that you're focused on. Even things as simple as using dedicated gear for sites. Um, that don't have invasive species and having it color coded so you can quickly see if, um, if the right gear is on. So those are, are just some little tricks, I guess, uh, with making sure you're inspecting, decontaminating and using clean gear when you're going to sites. And again, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, different decontamination protocols are gonna be useful Clean, drain, dry is really great messaging, not just for the public, but also internally. And so then once you aren't able to clean, drain, dry, if you're going to multiple sites in a day to do sampling, um, if that is critical that it needs to be done that way, you know, then you start looking at, um, do you have dedicated gear? Are you, you know, what are the, the what are the proper ways then for decontaminating? It really depends on, on your situation and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, kind of the basic making sure, again, the clean, drain, dry, drain water from any kind of equipment. And it's not just the boat motors and the, um, the boat itself, but any live wells um, and we're we try very hard to do this for our equipment and we ask, there's a lot of work in the West that's tied to um, boat operations and watercraft inspection and decontamination. And um, there have been a lot of protocols developed um, by the Western Regional Panel and a lot of cooperators and researchers. A lot of this is tied to decontamination for zebra and quagga mussels, um, but it is a lot of it is very, very effective at reducing the risk from aquatic invasive species in general. And I put this into is, is thinking about just introductions and visitors is not just visitors of the public, but it's just people coming um, from other places. So, you know, for example, a, a national wildlife refuge or a facility, a national park, um, making sure that 
uh, key locations on public lands that there's information provided about invasive species and help just providing information about um, ways to prevent moving invasive species like cleaning footwear prior to entry. Um, again, the clean, drain, dry messaging. And this could even be, you know, directing uh, having pathways or walkways or sidewalks to sort of direct where you actually have people moving in, in an effort to um, reduce the impact or unintentional movement of invasive species. So, um, you know, having key points of entry, that's where you can provide information, but, but also you can direct um, like pa uh, patterns of people's, people's movement. And even having if in highly sensitive habitats, like, um, you know, some of our springs, I, I'm thinking of one in, in Ash Meadows National Wildlife Refuge, the um, desert hole pupfish, it's, it's a spring and, and it's very remote. Um, even some of our islands and caves having these really um, uh, very sensitive habitats, um, having mandatory protocols for quarantine and dedicated um, gear and materials. And so those are just some examples of, of best management practices of even just reducing unintentional introductions. All right, so monitoring also is very, very important in our prevention efforts. And, you know, especially that um, being able to say, well, we have monitored this site and we, we um, have a 95% confidence rate that when we've been there, we have not been able to detect this species. And so I'm just, I'm highlighting this map here. This is a map showing the Columbia River Basin and all the work that is being done um, for monitoring. And this is aquatic monitoring. The different colors are the, mainly the different agencies that are contributing data to this work. And so this is annual monitoring. Um, again, many agencies are doing this. This is states, federal agencies, our tribal partners. And um, uh, you know, a lot of this is work that's focused on um, preventing zebra and quagga mussels, but I want to highlight that um, you know, really the, the work for aquatic invasive species is opportunistic. And so if we're already out in the field conducting this work and monitoring for invasive dracinid mussels, it's actually relatively easy to look for other things. A lot of our work is tied to um, aquatic plant uh, monitoring as well, and New Zealand mud snail monitoring. And I do wanna highlight too that it's not just the US, we have a lot of collaborative work into um, Canada with both tribal, provincial and government agencies. Um, and, and really there, there are so many groups represented here, even our public utility districts and several cities also contribute to a lot of this work. And, and I know that in the Great Lakes, there is a similar level of effort of sampling across multiple agencies. Um, here, you know, data, coordinating data, um, consolidating data and metadata is very challenging, but it's very well worth it. And um, for the Columbia River Basin, we have at least an annual meeting. We have working group meetings. We try to coordinate our sampling and share our planned sampling locations and then follow up at the end of the year. So there is a fair amount of um, collaboration that goes on. When we say monitoring, you know, what do we mean? And so there's, you know, a combination of visual surveys. And so this is, you know, the whole gamut of qualitative versus quantitative surveys. Um, you know, just one example of some of the visual surveys is with this um, kind of a view box. There's all different kinds. I mean, you could do snorkeling surveys, you can do scuba, the, this viewing bucket. Um, there's different ways to just do some type of a timed qualitative search. Um, in this case, looking for New Zealand mud snails. Um, 
you know, eDNA sampling right now is pretty amazing with the new technologies. And I know it, that uh, we're pretty lucky in the West to have um, Karen Goldberg and other researchers um, looking at eDNA. And I want to just highlight from one of Karen's papers from 2013, um, they were looking at you know, how effective eDNA was to uh, look for New Zealand mud snails in particular. And so they, in their assays that they've developed, they could find one or eDNA from one individual in one and a half liters of water. And, um, and that eDNA was detectable, it remained detectable um, for 21 to 44 days. I'm, I pulled this directly from their paper. And so they, they could use eDNA to confirm the presence of New, New Zealand mud snail with densities as low as 11 to 144 snails per meter squared. So those are really low densities compared to what um, has been seen in, um, in infested sites. So this, the, the use of eDNA, and, it, and it's only getting better as these techniques um, you know, are, are developed and field tested and, and reworked. And, um, and also how quickly things can be processed. You know, it's one thing to do monitoring and then it's another thing to get the results back and then have something that's actionable that you can do rapid response for. And so being able to detect um, things like New Zealand mud snails, which are really, really small and hard to see. Uh, and if you are able to detect using eDNA, really low densities, it gives you a chance to do our actual rapid response and move forward with that. And of course, then the quantitative surveys are really um, essential as well, looking at um, you know, impacts, ecological impacts, and looking at you know, population changes over time. And then our, our outreach. And again, this is such an important part of prevention is that knowledge and awareness and um, there's a lot focused on watercraft inspection and decontamination. And especially in the West, this has been um, uh, something that's worked on by many, many agencies. It's not just the states or, or the federal government. It's, it's everyone working together on this um, with aquatic invasive species check stations for watercraft, both motorized and non-motorized boats. Um, oops. Uh, so really focused on that watercraft inspection and decontamination. Uh, a big effort on don't let it loose to look at um, the pet industry and how to prevent the spread from aquarium releases and classrooms. Um, again, the play clean go, trying to focus on terrestrial invasives and stopping the movement of invasive species from just outdoor recreation. And again, our clean drain dry. And you know, this, this, messaging, this messaging works for the public as well as um, those of us working at, on this as part of our jobs. And one thing that we've found that, you know, while it's good to, to share the clean drain dry messaging, it's also important to try to uh, show where New Zealand mud snails were infestations are. And so we've tried a combination of signs. The, the sign on the right, the, the blue sign is our newer updated um, signage that we've installed in areas where we, we know that there are New Zealand mud snails um, just to try to give a, um, you know, a site specific uh, warning that there are New Zealand mud snails present and what people can do. And if they see things or something that looks different um, to be able to report it. So it's a combination of, of messaging to the different user groups, but also on site. Uh, so then we have some online tools. I, I do want to highlight the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force is a really fantastic um, location. There's a lot of species specific plans. There's a lot of work that's gone on for, for many years through the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force focused on invasive species prevention and management. 
And there is a uh, management plan for New Zealand mud snail. I think the goal is to have it updated this year in 2021, if not, you know, early 2022. But there's our, there's a lot of really good information in the existing management plan, um, as well as kind of research needs and, and priorities for work. Um, that's it's not just the only one. There's there's many different species specific. Um, management plans. There's there's just a lot of information on that website for prevention, and it's really focused on invasive species work. Um, I already highlighted a little bit about the ecological risk screening summaries, and I think there's, uh, last time I looked, I mean, there's over a thousand species um, risk summaries that have been completed. And so they're just important uh, summaries to see of, of the invasion risk of different invasive species, aquatic invasive species. The Aquatic Invasive Species Network, the Western AIS.org site, there is so much information on that site. Um, it's really Western focused, but I want to just highlight if you do go onto that website, there is um, a whole series of rapid response plans. Um, in the Columbia River Basin, we have been focused on rapid response um, practicing annually, rapid response. What does it look like if we happen to find zebra mussels in the Columbia River Basin? How do we, what, what do we do? Um, we implement the incident command, we um, you know, activate our communications plan, we, we practice that every year. And um, there's a whole summary of lessons learned um, from more, now almost 15 years of rapid response work and um, really an interagency collaborative effort, also research and training. So that's, again, that's a great uh, website with all kinds of information. And then there's new tools like um, story maps. And I wanted to highlight this one from the city of Bellevue in Washington. And it's really interesting way to connect some of the spatial tools like ArcGIS with um, meaningful storytelling, photos and imagery. And it's this, this one that I highlighted is tied to New Zealand mud snail sampling. Um, I did highlight the USGS, Nuisance Aquatic Species Database how to report sightings. This really is um, an important tool for me. Um, I, this is, if you're, you're looking at planning your sampling events, looking at this website, you can do a spatial query. Say you have um, two reaches of stream that you're going to be sampling. You can do, um, basically do a little uh, polygon around your sites and see what uh, reports of aquatic invasive species have been found in that area so you're prepared before you even go out in the field of what to look for. Um, there's also species profiles and there you can set up an alert system if you want to um, uh, get an alert every time a new uh, just a new drainage uh, say you say you want to see where northern snakehead pops up in in a new drainage you can get an auto alert on your an email and they say they have a whole bunch of other new tools. Um, EdMaps also, there's a fair amount of information, especially for um, you know, aquatic plants, but EdMaps is another online tool and other resource to look at distribution maps. And it's interesting too, with, for EdMaps, it shows you where sites have been sampled, where things have not been found, as well as presence. So presence and absence information, which is useful as well. Um, and then I did, I had some um, specific to the Pacific Northwest, some of our work in with our invasive species councils in Washington and Oregon, as well as Idaho. And I just, I wanted to highlight the importance of our invasive species councils in listing and being on the lookout for invaded in, invading species, both terrestrial and aquatic. Um, also our work with cooperative weed management areas. Um, several of those address both terrestrial and aquatic um, species. And then just also the, the outreach campaigns that are done by our states as well are really powerful.
and there's our my contact information. And so that is what I have, and I know that we have some time for questions. So I'm going to see if I can end this correctly. All right, so I stop that. See some smiling faces. And I'm ready for questions. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions in the chat for you. Uh, okay. The first one asking if you could elaborate on the seasonal population fluctuations, such as what time of year their populations are higher or lower in the US. Yeah, again, it's it that will depend on water temperature and you know where where in the US you are, but you know some of the seasonal distributions that I have um, seen or just even also read about is that they're typically lower densities in the winter and then um, kind of ramping up in the spring to the highest densities typically in the summer. All right, thank you. Um, another question, what method does the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service use to decontaminate their gear? We, we use many. So um, depending on, again, what, what we're doing, a lot of times we just have dedicated gear. And so that helps with, um, you know, the you don't necessarily have to be decontaminating if you if you only use this pair of waders in this one site. Um, you know, it's it, there's a little less um, rigor there when you have dedicated fuel gear. Um, but for our watercraft, again, we we do have a, a hot wash station, so we're um, we we use 140 degree water, and it's high pressure, high temperature. And that's done um, like cleaning everything, making sure that the outside is is um, yeah, is properly decontaminated. And then it's a little lower temperature, but for a little longer. So it's 120 degrees for the internal um, compartments, uh, but the, the contact time is a little longer. Um, freezing, we do freeze gear um, and that's, typically done overnight. I think the requirement is six hours, but it usually is longer than that. Um, yeah, that's, those are the, the kind of the key, key um, decontamination we use. Um, you know, it depends too, like for some of our hatcheries, you know, they're also tying in their biosecurity protocols. And so they're also looking at mitigating things like whirling disease. And so there's, there's some chemical treatments and um, uh, disinfectant that they use for that work. All right, thanks. Um, another question was, do you know what their distribution is in Canada, specifically British Columbia? That is a great question. I do not currently know the distribution of New Zealand mud snail. I'm assuming it's for New Zealand mud snail. Um, and we could find if, if, um, if you can let me know who asked that, I can find out. Um, that was actually a question from us. So oh, good. <laughs> we yeah, will, so uh, it's <laughs> tough. So that this is again, the, the data sharing. So we've, we've um, the Nuisance Aquatic Species Database for USGS, they are in the process of collaborating with Canada to be able to get the Canadian um, distributions included in that. And, and again, this is um, this has been a, a huge effort in the West. The Western Governors Association has a whole data mobilization campaign um, for the states to have consistent um, data and data fields and metadata that can be shared, but also for the federal agencies, we, we adhere to our data management policies that of, of sharing. And 
you know, we, we really do rely on being able to enter our data into the USGS, the, the NAS database. Um, but it, it again, again, like data management and, and then having accurate, complete, you know, metadata, the information about our data fields is, is really, um, it's so important. And um, it, it is something that we all work on a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, the data sharing and especially then across jurisdictions um, is, it can be challenging, but it's, it's definitely um, rewarding to be able to share information. Absolutely. All right, a uh, few more questions in the chat. This one's kind of long, so I'm just going to read it. Um, okay. It says, Denver Trout Unlimited found CU++, I'm assuming that's copper, at 16 parts per million was 100% effective in killing mud snails. Anyone find a weaker solution as effective? Drinking water standard is 1.2 parts per million. Maybe relaxation of wastewater treatment standard could rescue a stream. Anyone know of stream treatment studies going on? Yeah, so, so copper is definitely <clears throat> toxic to mollusks. And so the difficulty there is for, um, you know, killing of New Zealand mud snails, it's also killing our native snails, as well as our mussels. Uh, you know, copper is extremely toxic. Uh, also to, to many invertebrates and to people. So um, there, are, there are different treatment options. Um, it seems like in a closed system, that's gonna be a little more um, you know, possible. The, really the open water systems, it's really challenging because of the, the non-target impact to other organisms. I don't know if that gets at the answer, but um, <laughs> there are, so, so that, and that's why we really focus on the prevention is that when, especially New Zealand mud snails and some of these other um, aquatic invasive species, even dracinid mussels, when they become established, it really, um, you know, do the risks outweigh the benefits of using something as toxic as some of these copper treatments. And, um, you know, we, I don't think anyone takes that lightly of, of putting in, um, you know, something that's toxic into the environment. Certainly. Uh, last few questions. Um, they're all along kind of the same theme. So the first one is, what is the perception um, and angler attitudes towards implementing decontamination measures on their personal gear and equipment in the Western states? Um, is there any documented impacts of these decontamination measures to fish populations in infested rivers, such as growth and relative abundance? And are there any commercial cleaning or decontamination products that are safe for anglers to use? Um, so, so, so some of the, for the, for anglers, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, my experience with, with the fishing community is that you know, people want to protect their streams and the places that they love fishing. And so, I mean, it, it really is, um, you know, most, most people are very positive about doing things like um, cleaning their, their gear. And a big, big part of it is just knowledge and awareness. And um, especially for something as small as New Zealand mud snail, it's, it's hard to see them. When would you ever have the opportunity to see them if, if you're not at a, an event, you know, where we're sharing some of this or, or you just happen to be looking at what, I mean, some people fly fishing, um, they really are focused on what's emerging. So they are looking in the streams a lot, but um, yeah, you might not even be aware that New Zealand mud snails are there. Um, but yeah, cleaning gear, I, there, I haven't really experienced a lot of um, negative attitudes toward that. And um, uh, as far as impact to fisheries, I know that there's been some, there are some studies showing that, you know, in areas where there's a lot of New Zealand mud snails, 
it's thought that it's impacting fish that, you know, they're just not having a lot of tasty nutrient dense food um, if they're just eating New Zealand mud snails. Um, but I, as far as, um, is, I, there, there were some other, other parts of the question. Did I, I got the attitudes and then impact to the fish communities. Yeah, um, the last one was, are there any commercial cleaning or decontamination products that are uh, safe for anglers to use on their waders? Um, I mean, really, the the easy thing is is freezing. If if you can, if you have access to a, a, those those freezing, but but really the easiest is just cleaning, clean, clean with um, you know soapy water and a brush, clean, drain, dry. I mean, that's that's the easiest. Um, and as far as you know, commercial products, uh, really, yeah, the the yeah the the cleaning and the freezing is good. Um, one last question: Have any streams been actually closed due to infestations of mud snails? Oh, so that's that's a good question. There, I'm not aware of closures from New Zealand mud snail, um, but there are definitely impacts to things like hatchery operations. And so this isn't just unique to the West. I know you know, in the, the Midwest also like North Dakota, um, you know, there, there are many, there are a few states where hatchery operations have had to change because of New Zealand mud snail infestations and other things like e even zebra and quagga mussel infestation. So, so what has to happen, um, you know, for, to be able to move those fish, they have to be quarantined and make sure that if they have ingested any New Zealand mud snails, those have gone through their digestive tract so that if those fish are moved to another location, they aren't also moving New Zealand mud snails. And it also, you know, some states then will limit where those fish can be stocked. Like they couldn't be stocked in sites that don't have New Zealand mud snails. So um, that's not so much a stream closure that would be pretty hard to do, um, but there are impacts to facilities and operations. Okay, and uh, we actually just got another question in the chat, if you don't mind. Have there been any chemical treatments in the US to remove mud snails, and if so, where, and were they monitored for success? Um, so chemical treatments in streams, I'm yeah. assuming so. Stream. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not aware of, um, you know, a lot of research that's been done in the field. Oh, well, that is. Uh, that's all the questions that we have. So, Jeremy, I'll kick it back to you for closing remarks. Thanks so much, Teresa. That was really great and informative. I'm sure everybody enjoyed it and we appreciate your time. Um, we are past the hour now, so we'll wrap it up. If there are any other questions or you think of something after here, I believe Teresa gave her contact info. Um, we are recording it so you can review the presentation or pass it on to your colleagues uh, by accessing the website. Um, and then if you need to get in touch with any Thing about uh, if you don't have Trace's email or anything other questions you might have, you can uh, email info at nzmscollaborative.org. And thanks, Teresa. We really appreciate your time and all the information you shared with us. And um, you know, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all Our for cool. being here and stay safe and healthy, everyone. <laughs> Likewise. And thanks everyone for attending. Um, we'll give you updates on the next talk next month. And thanks again and have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.